Awesome. Okay, cool. Can everybody hear me okay? Sick. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Arlo Albelli. Uh, I am a fourth year PhD student here at BU, and I'm also a Red Hat intern. Um, and I work on a project called Dynamic Privilege. It was actually uh, originated with a, an elder PhD student of mine who was also a Red Hat intern, uh, Tommy Unger. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, our kind of journey through porting the original uh, implementation of Dynamic Privilege on the x86 architecture to 64-bit ARM and also talk a little bit about what motivates us to do this work. And um, I'm going to nod to a hopefully upcoming RISC-V implementation. Um, so I'll start with a little just like roadmap of what this is going to look like. Um, so first, I'm going to just define dynamic privilege. What is it? Um, and give some of the motivations uh, research-wise for, for why, we, why we do what we do. Um, then I'm going to take a look at just uh, the kernel patches for the x86 and ARM implementations and just do a kind of an overview of like what needed to be touched to enable this mechanism on these two different architectures. And in doing that, I'll go into some more detail about the more like interesting specifics about each implementation. And the lens I'm going to use to talk about that is uh, looking at the ways that the unique hardware architecture, the common kernel implementation, and the architecture specific bits of the kernel, how those kind of affected and shaped what we needed to do to implement dynamic privilege on ARM and x86. Um, and then I'll conclude with just a, a little forward looking to the RISC-V implementation and talk about some of the future work. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, um, so to start, uh, the definition for dynamic privilege generally is a mechanism that permits an authorized process to obtain and relinquish hardware privilege or supervisor privilege on the fly. Um, so that would grant a normal user process with hardware privilege, which gives it unrestricted memory access and full use of the whole instruction set, so privileged instructions and access to privileged thread counts. Um, and this looks very different than what we see in modern operating systems, where there's a very strict and static separation of what code runs privileged, what code does not, and there are very heavily architected uh, transition points between, so like, for example, a system call, you get, if you're trying to exercise privilege and ask the supervisor to do something for you, you're going to that entry point for the system where there's a lot of, like, well-architected code to, to maintain that. Um, so what dynamic privilege offers is actually separating the functionality so we can toggle privilege level without forcing a change in our flow control. So without necessitating that you're switching code base. Um, and some of our motivation for doing this, um, we've seen that uh, in, by introducing dynamic privilege to Linux, it's allowed us to like really rapidly and dynamically change the underlying operating system. So we're able to prototype and deploy certain specializations and some that we've actually seen in the past in specialized operating, like research systems. And we're able to do that quickly and I wouldn't say easily, but <laughs> in the context of Linux. Um, some examples of that are shortcutting into internal kernel routines to get performance and energy savings, um, and something called process caching, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, but like the ability to represent the full memory and register state of a process and like manipulate that, deploy from it, um, yeah. And so it also allows us to kind of just open up our underlying kernel as a toolbox or like as a library operating system almost. Um, and exploit it as a compatibility layer, like Linux is supported across many different architectures. So the goal would be to maybe uh, develop optimization tools that using Linux can actually be easily ported across architectures. Um, so with that being said, what does it actually look like to take this general mechanistic idea of dynamic privilege and instantiate it in a Linux kernel? Um, so the first implementation of this, like I said, um, was uh, credited with my, uh, grad, my fellow grad student, Tommy Unger. Um, and he did this on x86. And we've chosen to use the system call interface to, to enact dynamic privilege. So the functional goal here is a system call that will toggle our hardware privilege and return to the user calling context with that privilege. Um, and that's really all we want in this system call. We want it to be all mechanism and leave policy decisions out to like potential user libraries that use this functionality to build up policy, um, but we don't want to be prescriptive about that in the implementation. 
Um, and one analogy I like to use is like uh, a, it's almost like a hardware instruction that doesn't exist yet. So an instruction to just flip privilege. Um, <clears throat> so now I want to look and compare the kernel modifications that were required to actually realize this system call in x86 and then in my work to do it on ARM. So the first common thing that <laughs> had to be changed to add a system call is adding a system call. Um, so that is common to both architectures. And I just wanted to zoom out a little bit and look at like generically what that means um, and how that changes the shape of, of what, what this implementation looks like. And this is less interesting. We do just need, for accounting purposes, a bit in the task structs. So we, we have a, a little just flag that shows whether a process has been elevated or not. Um, but generically, across architectures, if we, the, the system call interface is a well-defined API. And at a high level, we have some hardware instruction that gets us from user context into the kernel. And that instruction does two things. It will change the privilege and also direct our flow control to a handler. And the opposite side of that will have a system exit instruction that will typically lower the hardware privilege back down and return you to the context that you came from. So that kind of, that pretty much sets up the structure that we need to follow where whatever we put into our system call handler here, we want that to be able to allow us to return out while maintaining the same level of privilege. So like I said before, in an ideal world, oh, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. In an ideal world, we ha might have something that looks like this. So like a hardware instruction, we have green here uh, to represent uh, user privilege mode. And then we would have a K-Elevate hardware instruction that allows us to continue on in our current context, but with exercising uh, supervisor privilege. We don't live in that ideal world, so a maybe worthwhile modification to the, the previous framework in this system call interface is whatever our handler does should be, should be able to enable us to exit with our change in flow control, but not changing our hardware privilege. So that's kind of our goal here um, for the system call. But now the more interesting parts have to do with the architecture specific bits that need to live in that handler to enable that to happen. So. so I'm gonna start by talking about, um, oh, sorry, I missed a slide. Um, so this is really uh, dictated by our kernel implementation. It is the common shape that the, both implementations will take because of the way that the kernel implements the syscall interface. So I've color-coded them yellow. Um, but now, if we move on, um, I'd like to talk about the way that this actually looks in the x86 specific sense and how x86 was a little bit of a weirdo. Um, so taking a similar graphic to the one that I just showed before, um, but making it more specific to x86, um, in x86, our privilege level is represented by the values that are in our segment registers here. So this is showing a user level state where our segment registers hold the user values. Um, but now when we want to execute a syscall, we will use the syscall instruction in x86, which in hardware will both get our flow control to our system call handler, but it will also populate the segment registers now with these statically defined kernel values for the segment selectors that are that live permanently in this register. Um, and uh, the same thing on the return path, when we do a, sys a system return, um, we're gonna be grabbing now the user values and it's hard coded that those will be what populates our segment registers. So there's really no wiggle room there. And what that means is that on this common exit from the kernel path, we will, anytime you execute a sysrat instruction, you will be lowered in privilege. Um, so it doesn't really leave us uh, a lot of room to modify our privilege in the system call handler and maintain that. And because of that, we had to add another architecture specific um, modification for x86, which is an alternate exit path. Um, so we need to make sure, say I have a process and I elevate, and then I suffer an interrupt, and I am exiting from my interrupt, I'm expecting that I still have the privilege that I just gave myself, but if I exit the kernel through that normal path, I'm going to be decremented in privilege. Um, so now that's where this kind of, this bit comes into play. On our exit path, we needed to 
basically duplicate the kernel exit and have a quick check where it's like, are you an elevated process? And if you are, I'm sending you out the, a different way that will use a return instruction rather than a sysret. So we've modified it so that the register state is uh, put back in, in to where it belongs, but we do not have to suffer the privilege drop. And now as a graduate student that was handed this fun code base and said do this for ARM, I was quite excited to have to learn how to do my own surgery of the ARM kernel exit path. Um, but it was really great to learn that that didn't need to happen. Um, and I'll talk about why. Um, and I once again forgot my little colors here. But so this blend of how the hardware architecture, so the implementation of those system enter and exit instructions, combined with the architecture specific kernel exit code and how it was written, necessitated us to make those changes. Um, now if we look at the ARM side, it's a similar picture, but gives us a little bit more flexibility. Um, so in ARM, we have a P state structure, which just represents the state of the current process. Um, and that actually derives most of its values from these other special purpose registers. But the only one that we really need to care about are these M bits. And those are what determine your privilege level. Um, now, when we do a supervisor call in ARM, or like the anal analogous instruction to syscall, as we enter the system, there's another register, the saved program status register, which is just basically our, like, our short-term storage to, base to save the state of the interrupted process. And then on return, oh, sorry. On return, that state gets populated back into the active process state. Um, so this sets us up for actually a really nice uh, opportunity in our system call handler to get between these two instructions and be able to modify the mode that is, oh, I'm sorry, modify the mode that gets saved in this register. And then when it's populated back by the ERET instruction, it becomes active and our modification is, is real. Um, so that is actually exactly how the architecture specific bits of made of K elevate on ARM work. Um, and similarly, it is due to the difference in the hardware implementation of that instruction that gives us that flexibility and doesn't uh, force the, dupli the duplication of an exit path. Um, so I was sitting there so happy with myself when I figured this out, and I was like, oh great, my first PhD project in like a month, let me kick my feet up on my desk and call it done. Um, and that is unfortunately <laughs> not the end of the story. Um, so as I went to go execute my next instruction, it brings us to another little fun caveat um, and another distinction between x86 and ARM implementation wise. Um, so here, this is the, uh, the barf that I stared at for three months of my life. <laughs> um, this is a level three permission fault, and it is apparently because, so in x86, our implementation really depended on a quite egregious hack. We had to ensure that um, the kernel was past the parameters no smap and no smep. And what that does is globally disable the controls that prevent a supervisor process from executing certain memory and accessing certain memory. So typically, user level text memory will be mapped so that we don't want the kernel to execute it. We don't want supervisor doing user things, because um, why would you? Uh, but we do. <laughs> so unfortunately, I spent the next three months trying to figure out how to find an analog to that on ARM, and it doesn't exist. Uh, or if it does, someone please tell me and save me. <laughs> However, it did kind of force us to think in, of a little bit more of an elegant solution and a not so heavy handed one to handling privileged memory access. Um, so we wanted to have a model for addressing the inability to execute a user instruction after elevating, um, but we didn't want to be prescriptive about the like policy. We wanted to enable as many different solutions to this as possible without statically assigning just one. Um, so, and once again, if anyone has any better ideas, please email me. But uh, the fix that we actually have in place as of right now um, is we pass an argument to the k elevate system call. And if, if that argument is passed, within the system call handler, we're going to look at what 
what address you're returning to uh, after the system call. And we're going to actually call kernel internal routines to modify the page tables for just that one single page so that it is executable by a privileged process. Um, and that'll kind of, that offers the flexibility for either whether you want to prefix pages that you know you're going to use. Um, we've also thought about maybe an implementation where on that safe executable page, you put a handler that uh, gets in between the page fault handler um, and actually on the fly will dynamically fix up pages if it knows that you're the elevated process. Um, and there are any number of other ways, but it's just like you have a safe landing pad to do what you please from there. Um, but yeah, so that was a fun way that the, the, <laughs> the difference in um, both architecture, because uh, the hardware bits that ARM offered for privilege execute never were unique to ARM, but also the page table uh, implementation of the Linux kernel and various other things influenced that different behavior across the architectures. But it was cool that it made us kind of take a closer look and actually introduce better functionality. I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Cool. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to do a quick overview of RISC-V and the future work, and then I will be done. Um, so our ARM implementation actually is like very similar to what RISC-V could look like. And I haven't done this yet, but I have spent hours poring over the manuals. <laughs> um, so as both being reduced instruction set architectures, um, a lot of the instructions are actually quite similar. And uh, RISC-V has an M status register that actually does the, a very similar thing to our saved program state in ARM. Um, it holds the pre-trap uh, process information, and that includes the privilege mode. Um, and again, similar to ARM ERET, the MRET instruction in RISC-V returns from the trap and puts the processor in the privilege, whatever privilege mode happens to be sitting in those bits, whether we've messed with them or not. Um, so the idea is to similarly modify the M status register in our handler, um, just like we modified P state in ARM. Um, and then I'm looking, very much looking forward to uh, whatever surprises that the memory access and permissions have in store for me this time. Um, and the reason that we're doing a lot of this uh, is just, so I mentioned before the process caching uh, infrastructure. Um, so it's a prototype that's starting to be developed on x86 using dynamic privilege <laughs> to try to gather lightweight representations of process memory and register state. And from that, either try to deploy optimizations by deploying pre-warmed up process snapshots or to try to take maybe some sort of machine learning approach to a data set of these snapshots and see if there's a, the potential to optimize. Um, and we'd really like to do that and do a comparison of that across architectures and would hope that developing the tool on top of Linux using dynamic privilege would make it easier to port common parts of it uh, quite easily to new architectures with a dynamic privilege um, mechanism. Um, yeah, and special thanks. So Tommy Unger, who I've mentioned, uh, who birthed this project, um, my advisor, Jonathan Apavu, my manager at Red Hat, Heidi Dempsey, and mentor Larry Woodman. Um, couldn't have got, done it without all of you folks, and that is all. Thank you. All right, I have a question. So what's, what's the security impact of this, if you're allowing user space commands to be run at elevated permissions? So our stance on security is that we don't have one. <laughs> so no, well, I mean, like kernel modules, you could insert a, a kernel module with just like sudo permissions and do whatever you want with that. It's like, I believe it's a policy rather than mechanistic choice. So like you can build up any model of, you could put this behind like uh, cherry capabilities, you could protect it with, but it's, I think it's kind of a, the, up to the developer to choose how, what level of security they want to prioritize having. So my takeaway would be that you're trying to define this mechanism and we'll deal with those concepts later. Let's figure out how to make this work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And see what we can do with it. Because especially it's like if you're working, if you're looking at like single tenant systems or, or like even uh, like virtualized hardware, the security implications <laughs> might not outweigh the desire to optimize for a particular application. But it's kind of in the hands of the programmer to decide what 
what level of security they'd like to see. Well, well, the light bulb went on in my head when you said I stared at that barf for a while because that barf is there for a reason, right? It's trying to prevent happening what you're trying to make happen. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that was part of the reason that uh, we really enjoyed the solution of only dynamically fixing those permissions on certain user pages rather than requiring the full, like, global uh, no SMAP, no SMAP. Uh, okay, so everybody, if you want your computers to work for in the future on Linux, send Arlo a check now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you. This, this, um, this is a, uh, Patch has been submitted upstream a couple times, multiple times, called Kernel Mode Linux. And what Kernel Mode Linux does is it allows you, it allows at a um, uh, higher level, I guess I'd say, to you, you to establish a set of processes that run in ring zero all the time. This is a finer level resolution to our granularity to this, in which you can make a, you, you want to go in and out of that mode versus being in that mode all the time. One of the and it just it provides similar functionality is that they can run privilege, they can run in ring zero, they can do things that a regular process can't do, but um, they can toggle going in and out of this privilege state. I get that, but what's the use case for this? What's a a, a process going to want to do that? Uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 I want to engage in that right thing, right? So my my what I love about this is it would let you. We're trying to capture. Yeah, oh, on the recording. So I, you were going to lead right into my question, right? I, Everybody here is talking about what happens when you give something more privilege. But I wanted to know what's the research angle for you guys in using this for dropping privilege in code? Mm -hmm. Have you guys explored any of that? There might be, I don't believe we have. But there might be certain functions uh, throughout the life of a program that you want to run as kernel and then go to the user space. And then you can. The, the program itself, rather than staying in kernel mode, as either, uh, i.e., the kernel mode Linux patch did, allow you to toggle back and forth to do, I don't know, if you wanted to run, I, I guess, a driver or something in user space. If you wanted to run a driver in user space and it just needed privilege, it needed ring zero for a certain um, memory access or certain instructions, there are certain instructions that will only allow you to, ex the hardware will only allow execution in ring zero. So, it, the, the allows you, it's, if you could, you, you, you have a lot more debugging and, and okay. flame graph and uh, um, performance evaluation of user mode code than you do kernel right. code. So, so my, my, my thought is that at, at user mode, you can do a lot more programming and not have to rebuild a driver. Right. And you can do something that the driver doesn't do at driver priority. Mm -hmm. So without yeah. having to rewrite the driver. And with all of the like libraries and tools of user space yeah. and not having to write to the kernel programming model. Interesting is scary kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? Oh, thank you very much. Oh, no, no, no. oh I'm sorry. Oh, no. let me take a second of this to come off. Um, so, uh, yeah, really great presentation. Very thank informative. Um, uh, so, if a user were to uh, yeah, if a user were to uh, to elevate privilege or manually drop privilege, then uh, how would this would this require? Are, are you are you trusting that the user will know uh, whether or not there whether or not there is an interrupt? Yeah, whether or not a, cer a certain process suffers an interrupt, would they be would they be required to monitor all processes um, at all times in, in order for this to be uh, viable? Um, what do you mean by so to mon like monitor for the interrupt? Why? Um, uh, ju like just uh, just to know when they ju just to know um, whether or not whether or not they should um, wh which processes uh, should should have privileges elevated so they can or whether or not that process should be manually exited. Is this is this all man is is the, uh, the 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 yeah the the elevation of privilege? This is all manual, right? Yes, it's okay. manual. So like you like we may in C code it would look like a syscall elevate and then you know that any code you're executing after that is elevated and okay. then you could do a syscall lower and you're and you're good. Okay. And um but this would but would this would this mean that the user would have to know uh yeah would would there be kind of kind of a um uh what, what what's the word an automatic yeah an, an automatic privilege elevation in case the user doesn't know if there's an interrupt uh 
or, or is that or is that the problem that you're trying to solve so that there won't be that automatic so that there won't be that that automatic privilege change because that'll lose the uh, because it'll lose the the uh, privilege when you're exiting from the original kernel path. Got it. Sorry. So actually, we we make sure that any process that has been elevated now has a it'll have a flag in its task struct that says like I'm elevated. Every single time a process is going out the exit path of the kernel, there's a check on that bit. It's like, are you elevated? If not, you can be normal and go out the normal path. If you are, we send you out a path that makes sure that you remain elevated. Okay. So there, it, it should behave as, as expected. So you will keep that privilege until you uh, like explicitly okay. relinquish. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Very good. Thank you.